if I want to. Thank you, Brother Mike. My, it's good to be here in this place again. For me, this is the oasis of the year. I come twice a year. When I come, the Lord speaks to my heart and I'm refreshed. I need a place like this. I need to hear the music. I need to hear the preaching. Well, I was blessed with that young fellow who just preached. <laughs> I'm glad to find some young men with some deep convictions. And I want to tell you, while the world looks like it's going to the dogs, God still got His remnant that love Him. He still got those that hunger and thirst and seek and find in this world. I'm glad that's true. And every once in a while, when I look at all that goes on around about me and begin to get discouraged, Time comes from me. Come to Mealdale, and I come and find young men, older men, who's got a heart for God, that desires to know God in fullness and power, that hungers and thirsts for righteousness. Now, Brother Bob, this verse is in the Bible. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 7, Sanctify yourselves. And be ye holy, for I am the Lord God. We need to understand God has given us something and someone in which we can yield all that we are and all that we have that He might manifest Himself in our lives and in this world. God has made provision for us in the journey. Well, I'm not, that's not my sermon, but it was on top, and I thought I'd get it off. <laughs> Thank you for being here this morning. I, I like the morning crowds because they're just getting awake, and they won't remember what I said. <laughs> Before I start, I want to do something, though. I want to sing a song. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I can carry a tune, I just can't unload that thing. <laughs> many days, many days, I have met many of you, not on this earth, when I bowed before my father, and called your name and felt your presence in his presence. God is good to make the distance between my heart and your heart very small. We don't have to be physically together to be together. God has made those kind of provisions for us in the journey. I listened to Brother Mike sing and our brother preach a moment ago and I thought of this beautiful old song. It simply says, I do not know the depth of Jesus' love that brought him down to earth from heaven above, nor why he bore the cross of Calvary or shed his precious blood so willingly. But this one thing I know, that when the crimson flow dropped to the earth below, it fell on me. My eyes were open wide. I saw Him crucified and knew for me He died on Calvary. Yeah. Boy, and every once in a while I want to get up and have a running spell just because of the God who loved me, who deserved to go to hell and deserved to be there. He loved me and I loved, never understand how He could love me. I want to ask you a question this morning before I get started. Is there deep down inside of you a heart that's filled with gratitude toward Him who redeemed you on the basis of His blood, reconciled you to a holy God? Well, when you come before Him with a heart that's filled with gratitude, then you lift your voice in praise and admiration and adoration and you express your gratitude to a holy and a righteous God. Someone said to give God glory. You don't have any glory to give God. 
If you want to give God glory, you know how? You let the Father look at you and see His Son. That glorifies the Father. The real truth of the matter is we labor in the energy of our flesh trying to please God and we strut, struggle and strain going down the road when all the time God's made all the provision that's necessary for you to be holy. Now I want to say this at the outset. God's standard is holy living. God's idea of success is not how many you had in Sunday school. It's not how large your budget is. It's not how big your building is. God's standard of success is how holy are your people walking. Holiness is God's standard. And when you're talking about living holy, some folks run off of this end and they make a long list of things they have to do so they'll be holy. Holy is not doing, holy is being, and if you are, you will. And if you're not, you won't. So you become that you might do. When you become the natural expression of who you are as holy living. Now here's the strut and struggle and strain, this war between law living and grace living. I hear that all the time. They don't say it like I do, but this war between law living and grace living. Folks, we are to obey God. But I want to tell you something. When that duty becomes the delight, then you're walking in grace living. But if serving the Lord is a strut, struggle, and strain for you, then you have a real problem with your surrender. A real difficult, with difficulty with your surrender. It should be a delight to go to church. It should be a great delight to open the book of God and hear from heaven. It should be a delight to get on your face before God and there bombard heaven with the desires of your heart. Hear from God and hold on until God responds to that that you've laid before Him that day. It should be a delight, not just a duty. It's all right to start with duty. But you keep on doing the duty until the surrender becomes so real till your duty becomes a delight. Serving God should be a delight in the journey. And God has prepared you to live holy. I tried to say to the church Sunday morning, we need a brokenness before God. I don't know many people are really broken over sin, do you? Sin separates from God. We talk about revival in America, and thank you, brother, we don't talk much about sin. We need a brokenness in our heart over sin and sinfulness until we know cleansing and fullness. We need a brokenness over the lostness of others. We need a brokenness that those around about us are blind and can't see, deaf and can't hear, walking a path that ultimately leads to separating them from God forever. We need a brokenness. We need a brokenness about the moral conditions of our nation. We need a brokenness before God. And you are prepared to be holy and to walk in that brokenness if you've been born from above. So I want you to turn with me for a little while, and Brother Jerry, I'll give you plenty of time. Where is he? I saw him. There he is. I'll give you plenty of time, I think. I'm in Judges chapter 13. Very familiar passage of, of Scripture. You know the story. Every preacher in the nation's preached on it more than one time. But I want to just read a few verses and then launch out from there. Is that all right? You said you was in a good mood, didn't you? Hello? All right, I'm in chapter 13. I've got 15 after 11, is that right? 10. I'm still on Easter time, I'm sorry. 
I'm going to put my watch there. I don't know what that means, but I'm going to put it there anyway. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bore not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. Let's stop reading right there. You starting to say something? Okay. I want you to notice a few things. One is, I want you to notice that this child that would be born would be prepared to live a holy life. It was God's purpose for him. He was prepared by his birth. He was prepared by the blessing, and he was prepared by a burden. His birth was initiated by God. He did not initiate it. I like the way our brother illustrated a moment ago, God reached out and got his hand and brought him, brought him to the Savior. That always happens. The old preachers where I grew up called it Holy Ghost Conviction. If you see a lost man come into the church, he would feel loved, but he'd not be comfortable. Because he couldn't be comfortable, he didn't fit. And the reason he didn't fit, he, he wasn't fitable at that moment until the Father took him by the hand, brought him to the Son. Gave him to the Son. And at that moment, the son did a marvelous thing. It's so mysterious that our minds cannot comprehend it. The son took him back 2,000 years and identified with him on the cross, buried him, resurrected him, and at that moment, he was brand new. I heard one preacher say, you can be saved and not be changed, not according to the book of God. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, new creature, all things passed away and all things become new. God makes him new. Now he fits. He comes back next Sunday with gratitude in his heart. He's willing to lift his voice and his hands in praise, lavish his affections upon a holy God. He sits with an open heart. The man of God opens the book of God. He takes the truth of God. That truth conformed him to the image of the Son of God. He walks out into the community a new man refreshed every time he gets in the Word of God. What are you saying? I'm saying God's prepared you by birth to live a holy life. Samson was prepared by blessing also he was to be a Nazarite. There's only three in the Bible. But he was to be one of those three. A Nazarite. A covenant relationship to a holy God. And that covenant would stand upon three legs. His hair was not to be cut. One guy came in my office one time. He said, I said, why do you wear your hair like that? He says, it's a symbol of my strength. I said, well, it was a symbol of Samson's weakness. It was a symbol of his dependence upon his God, not of his strength. So it stood on one leg. His hair was not to be cut. Secondly, he was not to take anything in his body that was corrupt. No strong drink, no, nothing corrupt within. Wasn't supposed to touch any dead body, nothing corrupt without. You see, the idea of a Nazarite vow was holiness. That was the idea of the Nazarite. He would live separated. Sanctify is the word in Leviticus. Sanctify, and in the Greek text, is hagoi, meaning saint or separated, not just from sin, but to the Savior. And when God saved you, He separated you 
from sin to the Savior. And you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Don't run around telling me you can do as you please. You can do as God please, but you got no business doing as you please. And when do as you please, you're in rebelliousness against God. We do not belong to ourselves anymore. Holy people, peculiar people, we're separated from sin that separates from God to the Savior on the basis of the blood of the cross prepared by our birth. And we're prepared by a blessing. That blessing is, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. When God saved you, the Holy Spirit quickened your human nature, came to dwell within you, and your body became the tabernacle of the Spirit of God. What, know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost that's in you, that you're not your own, that you're bought with a price? Christ in you, the hope of glory. So now I have a new life source born from above, have a relationship to the living Christ, have the Son. He that hath the Son hath life. Life manifests itself in the action attitudes of the redeemed. And so we walk out into the world and they look at us and we bury our dead and tears cross our cheeks. There's an ache in our heart, but deep beneath that ache is the joy of the Lord and a hope that lets us cope with the circumstance that we face. We walk out and the things around us and our society seem to be collapsing on every hand. But we don't live on the, the economy of this world. We live on God's economy. And by the way, let me put this in preacher. Your church is not your support. God's your support. They just use your, He just uses your church. When God saved you, He put you on His pay, payroll. When God calls you, He puts you on His payroll. He's your supply. He'll use that church or another church or somebody to meet every need you have along the way. He's made every provision for life and godliness for you. What are you saying, preacher? I'm simply saying, trust Him. Believe Him. Walk with Him. Understand Him and the world will see you different. You won't have to worry about the strut, struggle, and strain of trying to hold on and hold out. He'll so command the affection of your heart that the burning passion within you to be to please Him above everything else. What are you saying? I'm simply saying that if we're to be a holy people separated from sin to the Savior, we're going to have to come with brokenness before God and confess. I used to go to Calpin, South Carolina, where Miss Bertha Smith lived. And I'd, always, I'd get in a jam, and I didn't live too far from her. And She'd say, come up. Brother Malcolm, she'd put me in a room and give me a yellow pad and a handful of pencils, and she'd say, make your sin list. First time I went up, I thought I'd be through in five minutes, but boy, the more I prayed, the longer that list got. She'd say, go back. And start with number one, deal with number one, you and God. But if it involves someone else, don't mark that one off till you get straight with that individual, whoever it is. Get on the phone, whatever you need to do. You be clean before God. Are you hearing me? You get clean, but you get separated from sin that you might know the holiness of God. You've been prepared by your birth and by the consciousness that God will never, ever leave you. I heard a camp meeting preacher preach the other night, and he preached on when God leaves you alone. Now, I know God can say nothing, but He never leaves you alone. Not if you belong to Him. He dwells within you and has become your life source. He never leaves His children alone. You can't run out of His presence and you can't hide from Him. You can't get away from Him. He bought you with His blood and He's going to pursue you. He's predetermined to conform you to the image of His Son. Is that not true? God has predetermined some things from our life. He has set the parameters in which we are to live, and that's separated from sin. He's prepared us by birth. He's prepared us by blessing the Spirit of God who lives within us. 
And we should be a prepared people to see revival in this day before He comes because of the burden of the Lord on our heart to see Him manifested in this country, in our churches. You know why the churches are in the condition they're in? I know the pulpit bears much blame, but every born-again child of God, this coming Lord's Day, if they met in the house of God, the church house, and their hearts was burdened for the manifested presence of God, and rather than waiting for the preacher to preach or the singer to sing, gathered around an old-fashioned altar with brokenness before God because of their sin and because of the sin of this nation, you'd see a moving of the Spirit of God. Broken before God. Separated from sin to the Savior. Prepared for it by birth so we confess with our lips. Con- prepared for it by blessing the Spirit of God is with us and in us, prepared by burden. I'm afraid that many of us do not have burdens. And the reason is, y'all still awake? We live careless. Holiness is God's purpose. But carelessness became Samson's pattern of living. So what would go would be the the desires of his flesh would override the truth that he knew. I've made this statement. One man rebuked me pretty hard because I call Samson a whoremonger, and that's what he was. That's what the Bible calls him. Samson walked in the energy of his flesh and disregarded his covenant with God. You found him down in the Vineyard when he wasn't supposed to be there. Went down and made a covenant with the Philistines, which was the enemies of God. Notice the carelessness of his life. The compromise with what he knew. The covenant was disregarded in his understanding. Careless living. Isn't that what we've been doing in America in our churches? Someone asked me, said, How am I going to build this church? I said, you can't build God's church. Are you listening? Preacher, God didn't send you to build a church. He called you to walk holy and to hear Him and obey Him. And God through Him will come down the aisle and draw men to the Savior. So if you'll quit the strut, struggle, and strain trying to be popular because you've built a big church, Oh, Dr. Criswell used to say, you young preachers, and I was young. I had hair back then. He said, if you young preachers want a big church, go out and win enough people to build one. Are you all listening? God sent us to be holy people. Holy man in the pulpit. Holy people on the pew. Holy people in the community. To where the world in their dark, depraved, naturalness, Look at us and see a difference in our lives. We need to understand that God has made provision for us and careless living has robbed us. We're careless about our time. Boy, I, I might as well say what comes up, right? One of the things that's bothered me more than anything I know is for you men or men to talk about loving their sons and at revival meeting time take them out to play wiffle ball or something. One man came to me and said, we'll not be at church on Sunday night. My son and I play golf on Sunday afternoon and we don't usually get back in time to come to church. And I said, you love him? He said, I sure do and that's family time. I said, that's not family time. If you wanted family time, you'd bring him to the house of God. You know what you're teaching your son? He said, what? I said, you're teaching him golf is more important than God. So our time, we compromise our time. Everything gets in the way. Our bodies are tired and we want to take God's day to rest our bodies. 
But what we're really doing is self-centeredness and feeding our flesh. And so we'll sleep on Sunday nights. When it comes time for the people of God to pray, to gather on Wednesday night, and do a Bible study, a prayer, whatever you do, or to be prayer meeting, but we've got too much to do. We're too busy. The smallest crowd is the prayer meeting crowd. Isn't that something? Smallest crowd. You see, what we do, we live carelessly with our time. The Bible says, and this is in the book, Brother Bob, the Bible says, redeem the time, for the days are evil. Did you know your time's under a curse, and everybody around you will rob your time? Your boss will rob your time. Your family will rob your time. Everybody will take your time from God and godly things. You need to redeem the time. You need to discipline the time. You need to walk in the time. And when you give a man some time, that's all you can give him. You can't give it to anyone else. It's important. It's part of your life. You need to redeem the time. So we're careless with our time. We're careless with our talent. I want my boy, and I love sports. Now, y'all go ahead and condemn me. It's okay. I love sports. We want our boy to play ball. You'd rather him to be a big ball player than you had to be a big prayer. I have two sons. Thank God both of them are serving the Lord. I'm grateful for that. I have one son that teaches the Scriptures and weeps while he does it. God has just done such a work in his heart. We need to understand something, folks. There's more important than make, something more important than making millions of dollars praying, playing ball. A lady said to me not long ago, I want my daughter to be popular. And the reason she said that, I had just said, some of you mamas are raising your children to go to hell. And she didn't like my statement. She said, I want my daughter to be popular. And I said, that's the reason she just wears a half a dress rather than a whole one. I'm telling the truth. Listen to me, Mama. If you want your daughter to be popular, you introduce her to the living Christ. And you help her to develop this relationship with Him and to where she sits in the dining room in her school and bows her head and thank God for what He's provided for. I'll guarantee you she'll be popular. Everybody in there know where, who she is. But the tragedy is we want to compromise even our families for the worldly values and then wonder why when they get 18, 19, and 20 they behave the way they behave. When does it start? When they're small. You see, we compromise our time in our home. We compromise the relationships in our family. We compromise our talents and gifts. So we'll spend our time playing ball. We'll spend our time having fun. We'll seek pleasure, and it burns within us like a fever. America's sick on this idea of pleasure all across the nation. Watch on Sunday afternoon how many trucks pass your church with a boat pool behind it. You're being ugly. No, I'm not being ugly. I'm just telling you that we live in a compromised position. And you know what's happened? Like Samson. Finally, Samson met Delilah. Oh, this naturalness of his flesh came to the forefront. Now notice, he satisfied the desires of his own flesh. It wasn't a minute like folks think it is over a period of time. And now on this particular day, for the last time, he's mocked her, she's begged him, and pled with him. His legs are broken. He's touched a lion. 
that was a dead body, wasn't supposed to touch anything corrupt, not supposed to cut his hair. He had a covenant with his God. He was God's champion. He was prepared by birth, by blessing, by burden. The church of Christ in this world is the champion of God to penetrate the culture and the power of the Spirit of God. They tell me I have to embrace the culture. I do not. But I am commissioned to penetrate the culture with the truth of God. And Samson had lived so careless that he finally says to her, no razor has ever touched my head. Some of you men can't say that, but he, he could. No, no razor has ever touched my head. Somehow I want to run in that room when I read the story. And I want to cry, Samson, wake up. You've touched the lion, the dead body. You wasn't supposed to do that. You're down in the vineyard. You wasn't supposed to be there. Samson, wake up! It's the last leg of your covenant. Now he satisfies the desires of his flesh. She's already made a deal with those who wanted to put him to death. He was an enemy to them. He's there, and she cuts his hair. Samson, the Philistines are upon thee out of the back room. They come, and they put his eyes out, and they bind him. Isn't it sad that the church of Jesus Christ is so blind in America that she doesn't know where she is in the journey? God's champion, not able to see, prepared by blessing, by burden, by birth. God's champion without the ability to see. And they bind him. Now he'd been strong. And they carry him to an old grinding mill. And they hook him where they usually do the mules. He begins to grind. He discovers something immediately. He wasn't half as strong as he thought he was. And I don't know what Samson prayed. The Bible doesn't tell us, but it does tell us a little thing. It says, and his hair began to grow. What was his hair? A symbol of his dependence upon his God. I don't know what he prayed, Brother Malcolm. Maybe he prayed like this, God, I have no strength of my own. I can't hardly push this grinding mill. And God, it wasn't me that caught those foxes and put the torch between their tails and burned the fields. I couldn't run down those 300 foxes. And God, it wasn't me that took the jawbone of an ass and slew a thousand. That was you. And I didn't have the strength to take the lentils from a doorpost and carry them to a mountaintop. That was you. And he began again to recognize his God. In just a little while, some little old boy came, knocked on the door, and said to those guards, I've come for the man Samson. They unshackle him from that grinding wheel, and he starts toward the pagan temple, Dagon. Here he is, God's champion, blind, ball, bound. And sometime I see Samson as the churches that I've visited in this country, blind and bald and shackled by their sin and sinfulness and by the carelessness of their lives. And when he walks toward the temple, and he walks in that old temple, the enemies of God begin to mock the God of Israel. Our God's greater than the God of Israel! Can I tell you beautiful people something this morning? In the country where you live, they're mocking your God. They mock us on every hand. They think if you believe the Bible that you're an ignoramus. 
they think. You can even go to the schools of higher learnings and find those academic nuts who open the book of God and deny what it says. America is in such condition of blindness and baldness and boundness until, until we come to weep over our sin and sinfulness, until we do like Nehemiah did and pray and stand before God and bow before Him. America will keep walking this way. Now I know what some of you prophetic people think. You think it's too late for that. America's on her way to destruction. Nothing you can do. God raises up and God tears down. So we'll just idly go along the way. Oh, listen to me, folks. It's always darkened before the dawn. And in the history of revival, you historians, it's always been dark before God broke light. And I want to submit to you this morning that it's not too late for a moving of God across this nation. And the only thing that's limiting it is the people of God. We're the only thing on this earth that can limit God. And we limit Him by our careless living, by our disobedience. Uselessness became Samson's problem. Holiness was God's plan. Carelessness became his pattern of living. And uselessness became his problem. Some of you daddies have lived so careless before your children until you have no witness to them. Useless as far as the kingdom is concerned. Some homes have lived so careless till they have no influence in their neighborhood. Useless as far as the kingdom is concerned. Some churches have lived so careless and so compromising until they have no influence in the community. They fuss and feud and fight. God's champions blind and bold and the world mocks us and makes fun of us. And the world out there wants nothing to do with us. We're not the magnet that God intended us to be, that men might be drawn to the Savior. Look around us. Is God still saving folks? Why, certainly. Who will God save? Those that believe. Some man came to me and said, You don't believe in limited atonement? I said, Yes, if you'll put it in the future tense, you'll get that later. He said, What do you mean? I said, at the consummation of the age, you can look back and say, it was limited to those that would believe. But until then, it's whosoever will may come and take of the water of life freely. That means man who has a, an awakening in his heart to understand his need to the Savior. He can come. The desperate need is for us as a people to understand. How many of you came down here expecting God to do something in you? I want to ask you some questions. Have you spent enough time before God for God to do it? Oh, I want it done in the preaching. Why well, the preaching's going on? Well, the preaching's wonderful. I've been blessed last night and this morning. Preaching's wonderful. But that's not where God deals with my heart. God deals with my heart in an old-fashioned altar when I bow down before holy and righteous God and get honest with God and lay the burdens that cause me to walk downward before Him and leave them there. Have you spent enough time before God for God to do in you what you desired Him to do? Well, maybe you came and you just wanted something. You didn't know what you wanted. You just wanted to come. You are a work watcher. But you need to quit being a work watcher and become a way walker. You need to learn to walk God's way. 
A lot of folk want to just watch God work. I mean, boy, wouldn't it be wonderful? Everybody shouting down the aisles and God save a few folks. I mean, you know, hallelujah. But we just want to watch God work. Let me tell you, when it gets real, when God does something so within us that exposes me to me, I'm already exposed to Him. Exposes me to me. And I see needs I didn't know I had. And God begins to meet those needs. I'll bow down to confess my sin and I become conscious that if He is faithful and just, and He is, to forgive my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And by faith, I rise up to believe the promises of God, appropriate the truth that God has revealed to my mind from my heart. And God does a cleansing work in my life. Are you listening? We deal with ourself and our sinfulness. Well, the devil's given me a hard time. You ever heard that? Well, I know the devil is at work, but most of the time it's not the devil. It's your dirty, rotten, sinful flesh. It's just you. Boy, he gets blamed for a lot of things. I went up to Tennessee to do a meeting. They was telling me how bad the devil's beating up the church and so I got up and I said, when I came in, I saw the devil on the front porch and they all said, amen, amen. And I said, he is crying. I said, devil, what's wrong with you? He said, that bunch of Baptists is blaming me for stuff I didn't do. Amen. The real truth of the matter is, the real truth of the matter is, we are where we are because of the carelessness of our life. We've not understood the parameters in which God has set about our lives. And we do not know who we belong to. We think we belong to ourselves. We can do with our, as we please. And we Baptists are great on this autonomy of the local body. That doesn't mean liberty to live like the devil and act like the world. What that means is we can before God have one head and hear Him and obey Him for His own glory. What are you saying? I'm saying the tragedy today. Y'all going to forgive me, not get mad at me? The tragedy today in America. Not that God has not sufficient for all of our needs, He is. But we've lived so careless until we're blind and can't see it. Deaf and can't hear it. And our sons and our daughters practice religion and do not enjoy life. Hear me, my last statement, and then I'm going to sit down and let Jerry come or whoever. Christianity is not a religion. It's a life. A life that's experienced, a life that's expressed. You cannot live holy and perfect in the flesh what God begun in the Spirit. That means this idea of walking Spirit-filled is an imperative in the Christian life. And to be full with the Spirit doesn't mean I jump pews and run up down the aisle. To be full of the Spirit simply means I'm controlled by Him. That He deals with my everyday life as our Young preacher said a while ago. He deals with our everyday life. He keeps me from cussing with my horn. Y'all didn't get that, did you? Somebody said to Dr. Rogers many years ago about missing the shot on the golf course. And he said, it doesn't up, you did not like it upset you at all. He said, I spit on the ground. You saw where the grass died, didn't you? We need to understand, as our brother said earlier, God has set some parameters, and the only way we can walk in those parameters is understand. It's, we cannot believe that old Baptist lie. You do the best you can, God will do the rest. That's a lie. Jesus said, and I'd rather believe him than I had all that than you, he said, without me, you can do how much? 
He's your life source. He set the parameters for it. Build that relationship with Him. Walk in the brokenness, understanding that sin separates. Be clean. Keep a short list on your sin. And I'll guarantee you, around about you, the wind will blow. But in the middle of the windstorm, there'll be the calm, tranquil peace that passes all understanding. God bless you. I trust to see you here again someday. But should I not, and the Lord come for me before He come for you, I'll be looking for you. Don't live in the strut and struggle and strain of your human frailty trying to please and appease a holy God. He satisfied His own demands in the blood of the cross. And He gave us life that we might live in the fullness of His provision in the journey. Don't settle for religion when you can walk in life. Father, thank you for letting me share a little bit this morning out of my heart. Lord, we're in a mess. We're in a mess in this country. When you deal with the theologues of our land, you'll discover, we've discovered, I've discovered, that we're so confused, we're like a termite in the yo-yo. Today we're here, tomorrow we're there. Father, Father, Father. We're in a mess. Our desperate need is you to illuminate our minds and fill our hearts. The psalmist said, As the heart paineth after the water brook, so paineth my heart after thee, O God. Would you stir your church and your people that we might hunger and thirst for you, that there would be a holy desire to know more than we've ever known, to go deeper than we've ever been, higher than we've ever been, to know you in fullness and in power. Oh, my Father, would you let us see our sin, bring Holy Ghost conviction about sin, bring illumination to our minds that we might see Give us ears that we might hear. Oh God, we need revival desperately in this land. We know you revive the hearts of your children. So would you begin with me and begin with us? Would you break our hearts because of the lostness of our families and our friends? Would you let us see the dilemma in which America stands, how you've blessed us in the past, and yet, Lord, We've denied you and we've sinned before you. Oh God, we need wind and fire. We need breath from heaven that converts, convicts. You're the only one that can. There's none beside you. And I've not come to inform you, Lord. You know it all. Yet I've come to acknowledge that we've begun to see. Thank you for giving us sight to see. And while it burdens our heart, but more than burdens it, it breaks our heart. And we want to bow before you broken, and so would you break us. Would you do what's necessary in us to strip us of our arrogance and pride and that we might just stand before you, empty vessels to be filled by you, not by time, and not by the world, not by the culture that's around us, but to be filled with You, that You would occupy our mind till our time is all Your time, and the deeds of our life would simply reflect who You are. Oh, my Father, it's my desire to live in this life, the remainder of my days, holy. I want to live holy and sin no more. I want to hear instantly and clearly and obey you when you speak. And so in these days, would you do a work in me to the end of the journey and the work of these that come to the Mildale Conference that somehow in these days we might know revival and power. Thank you for the privilege to come. For I ask again and pray again in the name of the Lord Christ, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Before I leave, one more thing. 
Do you really, really? Not where your wife can see and not where your children can see and just where you and God are. Do you really, really desire? Really desire? You have a hunger. Do you really desire? Is there something deep down inside of you that wants to know more than you know and wants to experience more than you're experiencing of Him? Are you hungry? Do you know? Do you care that sin separates? Do you care that your lost family is lost? Do you care that your neighbors are lost? Do you care that the church of the Christ, redeemed by His blood, seems to want to feed the flesh rather than develop the Spirit? I know across the nation, and I don't want to leave you with that, there's churches that are strong in the Word. Thank God for them. I know that. But as a nation, folks, we are in trouble. God can correct it. Where is it going to start if it doesn't start with us?